Hello, everybody. I'm Cody. And I'm Brent. And we're the Hugo Nuts here to review and discuss with you the best sci fi novels of all time. This week, we are talking about Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. And make sure you like, subscribe, download, follow, however you listen to us so you don't miss our next episode, which will be on Contact by Carl Sagan. So exciting. These are both such good books. It's such a, such a good month. It really um, is. Yeah. And we have one quick ask for you. If you are listening to the podcast and you're on a podcast app of some kind, please, please, please leave us a, leave us a, a rating, review, give us the old five stars. Um, helps those algorithms push the content, which has started to happen a lot more on YouTube. Thank you, YouTube people, for liking videos and subscribing. They're showing them to a lot more people, which is awesome. We'd love to do the same thing on the podcast. So if you can leave us a rating and review, it would mean a lot, a lot. Um, yes, it would. Thank you. Let's... Yeah, why don't you tell us about Snow Crash, Brent? What's going to happen in this book? All right. So Snow Crash is a little bit longer book. It is uh, published in 1992. It is 480 pages or 17 hours on audiobook. And in it, the United States has been fully corporatized. Uh, so if you get in trouble, you go to Judge Bob's judicial system. Um, or if you want some religion, you go to Pastor Wayne's Pearly Gates, one of their franchises. Um, and our uh, protagonist, uh, our hero, is uh, named hero protagonist. Uh, he is a uh, self-described hacker um, who actually works as a pizza delivery driver and lives in a storage unit at LAX. And um, But to get away from that lifestyle, he spends a lot of time in the metaverse, which is this virtual world um, where he actually did write, uh, uh, you know, he wrote some code that, that underpins some of the metaverse and he actually is sort of an important guy there. Um, but uh, one of his hacker friends, David, is given this new virtual drug um, in the metaverse called Snow Crash. And when he takes it, not only does his computer crash, uh, but it also destroys his brain in the real world. And so Hero and his friends are drawn ever deeper into this worldwide conspiracy that is spilling out of the virtual world and into the real world. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, Snow Crash, um, you know, uh, I'll just come out and say it. I give this book a five out of five. I mean, I just think it is a fantastic, fantastic read. It's fun. It's fast. Um, it's funny. It's really engaging on multiple levels. The world is cool. The ideas are cool and turned out to be pretty prophetic, as we'll talk about. And um, it's just masterfully written action. It's just a phenomenal novel. What do you think? Yeah, I am. Uh, I totally agree. I'm also going to give it five stars. This book is one of our like few unanimous five star books. Ten um, out of ten. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is just, it's it's truly unbelievable that this book can simultaneously be like so funny, but then also like make you, it feels high stakes. Like it's both at the same time and that's really a testament to, to, to how well written it is and just how fun it is. Um, there's so many big ideas, super memorable technology. Um, yeah, we'll talk about all that. Yes. So uh, let's get into first what makes the action, the the kind of the read so compelling. I think the the fundamental thing there is the narrator and the narrator voice. It's a third person, um, omnipotent perspective, pretty common. You know, we just follow various characters chapter by chapter, but the narrator is like part of the world, is so... Um, kind of flippant, laissez-faire, uh, doesn't, you know, uses the language of the cyberpunk universe um, and also gets into each character's, kind of narrates each character's chapter with language that they would use and kind of with their emotional perspective. So Which much. is a really yeah. cool uh, function that I've not, I can't remember seeing before, but uh, it brings you into the character even more, even though you're it, with this removed narrator. Yeah, that that voice and that that bunch of voices really is yeah just so compelling. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and it, it it's it's like the narrator is like a cool guy who doesn't give a shit and is like fun to hang out with. Um, it's just yeah, it's 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 fun and 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 the whole thing Absolutely. is like tongue in cheek. Like it is not taking itself seriously. This is. Like, it's an exciting book, whatever, but, like, the main character is named Hero Protagonist. Like, we are not here to, like, 
blow smoke or pretend this is like something more than it is. This is like a fun, awesome book that's like not trying to be pretentious. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can also feel Stevenson's um, intelligence and kind of like mythical trivia knowledge level in the in the the metaphor and the language in the book it 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 feels like it's cascading over you there's a there's a different metaphor for how he's describing different things each time and they're always really intuitive um and great they stick with you and there's different vocabulary uh, vocabulary and language all the time um and it just feels like it flows out naturally it's not you know he's not busting out a thesaurus or something it's just it's just part of the flow um which is also really cool. You you mentioned, you know, moving on to characters, which is, is a funny topic. You mentioned hero protagonist is the main character, which gives it that satirical feel right away. Who are some other uh, ones we have? Yeah, um, the, uh, the second character, uh, second most important is YT, who is this like 15 year old skater punk girl. Um, YT is short for yours truly, but lots of people are constantly making fun of her. She's like a white girl. And they're always like, oh yeah, Whitey. Um, anyway, she does not like it when people do that. Uh, she has just a great attitude. She don't give a shit. Like she's just so fun and funny and a badass also. Um, yeah. She's a courier. She rides around her skateboard by harpooning cars, sketching on cars, yeah, she Basically, like, yeah, magnets. She gets her like magnetic harpoon on a car and like you can't shake her off. She's just like getting a free ride down the freeway. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, there's Uncle we got, Enzo. Yep. The head of the mafia, uh, Hero's boss. Uh, he's delivering pizzas for the mafia, in fact. Um, <laughs> Uncle Enzo is just like, I would love him to be the godfather of my child. Like he's just such a cool dude. He's so cool. Um yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah the yeah. mafia and this being kind of a Swiss neutral, like comedic relief almost. They're bad, they're good, they're fun. Um, and then there's a, for bad for actual bad guys, there's Raven, who is uh an Aleut who rides around a kayak um in a motorcycle uh and fights with glass weapons that can't be detected by uh, metal detectors or personal safety systems. And the most badass thing of all is that he has a Russian nuclear warhead that he's stolen from a submarine rigged to a trigger in his brain. So if anyone kills him, it triggers a nuclear explosion <laughs> from wherever his motorcycle is or, you know, different yep. sometimes. Yeah, but. he is an undisputed badass of this. There is no doubt. Um, and then finally, the big bad guy is L. Bob Rafe who is a monopolist who has taken over like all the world's um, um, communications infrastructure. I think he also invented the metaverse, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second, a little bit more. Um, And then now he is like kind of like using religion as a way to try to like get even more power. So he's our, you know, he's an extremely powerful guy, you know, billionaire type who is like not satisfied and wants even more. Um, And uh, yeah, good, good proper villain. Absolutely. Um, and, and this this novel is in kind of a, the Baroque style, I think it's called, um, which is to to mirror Baroque music. Which yeah, is, what does I mean, that very, mean? It sounds dusty. Ornamented and detailed um, and, <laughs> and dense. Uh, and, and so is Snow Crash. <laughs> um, it, the characters are all really rich and there's a ton of them. The world is really rich and there's a ton to it, but it all still flows um, so well. Uh, the central idea here though is the most prophetic part of all of what's in snow crash uh the metaverse yeah so that's this this uh, his name for this virtual world where uh a fair amount of the novel takes place um and it's of course an idea that's like very much rooted itself in our cultural zeitgeist obviously facebook has like changed their company's name to try to make their two-bit version of this. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, But yeah, so the metaverse is extremely immersive and that's like the actual, this is like the thing this novel is famous for, but there's a bunch of other science and tech that is super fun too, right? Yeah, um, they've got the way the computers work. They basically hit your retina or your optic nerve with, is that... Is that what a retina is? Anyways, they hit it with uh, <laughs> with laser rays. So they're, the computers are taking you into VR basically directly through your eyeballs. Um, there's uh, different automated security systems that are really fun, like cyborg dogs called the rat things. The rat things. Part- I love the rat yes. things. They're so cool. 
<laughs> they um, are so cool. And even yeah. to 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 our point earlier about Stevenson, like the narrator style, when he's talking about the rat things, it's like in the voice of like, and the other doggies were mad at the men. And like it's from like the a dog's point of view. Yeah, it's from like a cute dog's <laughs> point of view. Those chapters are very short. Don't worry. You don't have yeah, to read dog talk for sweet. very long. They're yeah, like but I page. love them. Uh, <laughs> but they're fun. There's also this idea that really has like the idea, the tech idea, other than the metaverse, that stuck with me the longest. This image I could like still see in my head 20 years after I read it the first time. YT, her skateboard, um, doesn't have solid wheels there. It's like a bunch of tiny spokes and they all automatically adjust their length to make any surface she's on just like perfectly smooth. So she can just like skateboard down like a hill, like in the woods. It's totally fine. Um, just such a cool, interesting idea. Um, at one point hero has like a badass motorcycle with the same kind of wheels and it just a, a lot of like fun little weird quirky tech stuff like that that like doesn't make too much sense but is so awesome yeah it's just fun and and silly and badass and all all those things it just propels propels forward and there's also a ton of stuff about the world like cool ideas that he's come up with um such as uh I guess the big one would be the raft, which is L. Bob Reif, the bad guy, um, has bought a, uh, a aircraft carrier, um, essentially from a from a government because everything's corporatized now. All all governments are corporatized, so he buys this aircraft carrier and just floats it around the Pacific, um, and various refugees and other people, uh, it's called the raft because they'll ride out smaller rafts and attach those rafts to the aircraft carrier. So it's become this floating city that has all the elements of a city, you know, markets, whatever. You've got the the lower socioeconomic zones and then the actual cruiser, which is the high class stuff with the storage container hotels. And it's just a really compelling um cool physical space that he's uh that stevenson made other than uh the metaverse which is the other compelling part yeah 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 absolutely um there's also uh a lot of interesting like religious history um which is real like a lot of these you, you get a bunch of like mythology and stories which are I mean, true in the way any mythology is true like they're real myths um but they're just brought together in this interesting way to make snow crash work um We'll mostly table that for now, and we'll talk about it more in the post-spoilers section. Um, the history and learning about that stuff is really, it's its a cool way to like get exposed to some myths. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I read this one for the first time when I was maybe 17, Snow Crash, and that's how I learned about the Council of Nicaea, where um, you know Christian leaders from different sects came together and decided what would move forward as canon um, and make Christianity officially. Um and so there's a lot of learning there. It does get, it, it sometimes gets a little slow, maybe in the middle sections of the book. It feels like a lot of exposition, this history stuff with Samaria and um, other religious history as he's, as Stevenson's trying to m create the point in the audience's mind that the, the rest of the plot hinges on. But uh, I actually just really liked all that stuff. Um, I know some people found it slow. I don't, what did you think? I liked it. I just wish it had been spread out a little bit more. There's like the middle, it's like there's like 20% of the book in the middle where like half the time is spent on that. And I wish it had just been spread out a little bit more. And also that the narrative way in which he's presenting it here is like just talking to this computer program who just like goes on long diatribes explaining things. Um, and yeah, anyway, if I have one, if I, if I have to pick a gripe about the book, that's what I'll gripe about. But like, it's, right. it's but not obviously, a big deal. Yeah. yeah. We both gave it fives, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing that I absolutely applaud Stevenson for is that he introduces music into the book in a really interesting uh, way that feels... Um, genuine to the world of the novel. Uh, there's this noise punk musician, Hero's roommate, Vitaly Chernobyl. Um, there's a, a rapper, Sushi K, who raps over the noise punk. There's this excellent concert scene that happens under a bridge with all yeah, the and the LA Aqueduct kids. for my LA friends. Yeah, yeah, and the throng of kids. The couriers are all riding their skateboards up and down the aqueduct. It just it feels like cyberpunk. Um, and I feel like that's so rare in science fiction. So many authors will be like, "Oh, I need to." say music happens here so it's space jazz or it's just Bach um, and you're 5,000 years in the future on a spaceship and that's what they're still listening to even when people don't um, 
usually select that as their first listening choice no these offense, days. Classical lovers, but you know that you're alone. You in know, this. you know that that's <laughs> not what most people are choosing. It just it brings me out of text sometimes that they're you know that uh, a guy you know the main character of Hyperion is um, playing on a grand piano on a spaceship. Like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. Anyways. Loved it in Snow Crash, the the noise punk. Yeah, it um, was really that was a really really fun scene. Um, it totally was. Yeah, in that scene, there's a the 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 rapper is like giving this hilarious like rap, which feels authentic to the way rap like often feels. Like he's like trying to brag about like how much money he is and how he's better than the other rappers, but just doing it in like a ridiculous funny way. And then it's intercut with like hero like finding a dead body. So it's like simultaneously like funny and also like oh wow this is crazy just like. All at once, which is this whole book in in just in one scene. Yeah, absolutely. And every scene, uh, it's a great microcosm of the rest of it. Uh, so we should talk a little bit about Stevenson himself, who's an interesting fellow. Um, he's kind of a famous recluse. Weirdly enough, uh, in in various books I've read along the way, sometimes I'll read, you know, one of those. Uh, I guess you would call it like self help, like a productivity book like science of productivity um and for whatever reason he is all over the place is an an anecdote in all those books he always pops out and i'm like wait should i be reading snow crash that was a pretty good book but <laughs> he he has this thing he goes to does the quintessential like secludes himself in a cabin cuts off all communications to the outside world to write um so maybe it's maybe it's the right way to do so and did it did it work on you when you hear about him sitting in a cabin in the woods doesn't make you work for 16 hours a day like you were hoping? No, uh, what it makes me want to do is stop reading those type of books and read f- sci-fi again instead. <laughs> I feel like I'll learn a lot more from fiction than nonfiction. Um, and those are often just like, you know, bloggy, like could have been a meme, but made it and stretched it into a book to make money. It's Anyways, true, there's some good too. ones. I love... I love the introduction to many like business books, but you actually only need to read the introduction. And then after that, they just all give like the same eight famous corporate examples and they just like twist them to fit their yeah. introduction they wrote. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. The the only uh, deep work I thought was was pretty decent. That's the one that Stevenson was featured the most heavily in. Um, but, uh, you know, we stray. We're not recommending those here. <laughs> uh, have we told you all about our pyramid scheme? Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to uh, read novels by us that are really just sent at 12 sentences that we stretch into full chapters with bad research and anecdotes? Okay, Stevenson. Originally uh, intended, weirdly, for Snow Crash to be a computer-generated like CGI novel. Uh, yeah, it was supposed to be a graphic, a graphic novel. novel. Yeah. And that so did weird. not work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank God we got this book out of it. But yeah, it's just like an interesting little view into the creative process. Like he set out to like make this, you know, sort of like tongue in cheek graphic novel and then just like failed. But then we got this book, which is an enormous success and like helped, you know, launch his extremely prolific, successful writing career. So you never know quite what's going to hit. Absolutely. And once it does hit, you get a sweet benefit, which we've talked to David Brin about on the podcast. And uh, also he told us uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's in this group. But Neil Stevenson is as well uh, a futurist. You can be a futurist if you have a, a novel or a story successful enough that the people in tech grow up reading you. They'll hire you to um, think of stuff that might happen in the future. Uh, yes. It seems like an uh, awesome job. <laughs> yeah, weird job. I think it mostly involves like uh, massaging egos so that, that you convince the rich the rich entrepreneur that they're doing the, the their thing is the future. Uh, but anyway, per, we start, perhaps we start. it is, but NASA hires too. NASA hires futurists too to, to do for sure. actual I'm not trying to knock ideas. the profession, but it does seem like a good <laughs> yeah. anyway. And I think it's just <laughs> consulting anyways. Um, but it's cool and it makes sense that Stevenson uh, does that as well. I think the company we found that we know he's worked for is Blue Origin, which is Bezos's space company. So maybe he gave him some better ideas than uh, just firing off into orbit and coming back down. Um, for the future, uh, there's one more thing. He told thing. them to, uh, start a religion like El Bob Reif. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, okay. So back to snow crash. 
Yes, we should mention there is some uh, some you know spotty language. There's moments that feel a little uncomfortable for the modern sensibility. Um, all those things are being portrayed negatively in the novel. They're things like the bad guys are doing that is part of like signaling that they're bad guys. Um, but they're not the way that we like talk today. Um, they don't really break the immersion uh, a lot, but worth worth you know just briefly mentioning. Um, so you know it's this like any work of literature is sort of like a product of the time it was written. Yeah. Um, so good to know going in. Um, and what else do we have here? Uh, you know, this is snow crash is considered a parody or satire by many, um, which we agree with. Uh, I mean, it, I think Neil just, Stevenson would say that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just, uh, I, it's interesting because satire in hands of somebody who's observant and skilled um, can really end up being the thing that it's satirizing so well that it becomes one of the pillars of the genre, which Snow Crash has. Um, and so what it what we get is like a perfect cyberpunk novel that's also really funny. Um, and and that's one of its one of its best elements is that he that was the direction he chose to take snow crash instead of just like trying to do cool stuff with cyberpunk yeah yeah it made it work really well i mean i'm excited to talk about neuromancer someday too which is like the, the other huge cyberpunk novel but like i'm so glad glad that snow crash exists and like you know just made this alternate version of 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 that world for us to explore yeah you're not um, gonna get a line like uh, run like clockwork in a watch, kick old rappers in the crotch uh, <laughs> from the prose that's trying to take itself seriously. <laughs> yes, that is right. Oh um, my gosh. All that being said, Snow Crash, absolutely phenomenal. We'll talk a little bit more post-spoilers, but for now, how about some wrecks? Some similar yeah. wrecks. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. To, you probably want me to start, right? You should, yes. You kind of you kind of busted me up. Um, but the first one that's the most obvious is Neuromancer by I'm William sorry, Gibson, so sorry, as you just so mentioned. So sorry, so sorry. <laughs> um that's that's even more the quintessential cyberpunk novel. I think that would be number one, number two being Snow Crash. Um, and it's the one that started it all. I mean, Gibson even kind of invented snow as the idea that Neuromancer opens with him describing uh, static as snow and that that's where the term snow crash is derived from. Uh, but it's a great just like corporate as corporate espionage thriller with a hacker and um, a dangerous biker sidekick, um, you know, fantastic twist at the end. It's really what you want to read if you loved the action element of snow crash. Yeah, for sure. If you loved the like religion, language, how your brain works part of Snow Crash, then you should read Babel 17 by Samuel Delaney, um, which is an old book. Uh, it's from the 60s or maybe even the 50s. Man, I should look at the date right before we did this. In any case, um, Samuel Delaney is a great writer, and it is a, the story of the sort of journey through the galaxy that's in the middle of a big war. And sort of trying to figure out what's happening. And there's this crazy linguistic stuff. Won't spoil the end, but it's like very much in that train of thought with Snow Crash. It's, um, uh, I mean, it's a successful novel, but it, I would say it also like, it's like kind of experimental is something I would say about it. Like it's out there. It's cool. Um, anyway, so Babel 17, check it out. Totally good. And if you loved the, um, the kind of just the comedic, nature the fun and funniness of snow crash then a book you're probably all already familiar with uh, we'd recommend would be bad omens by i'm sorry bad, bad omens. good omens <laughs> bad omen is the sweet band um good omens by terry pratchett and neil gaiman um which is a story about uh a demon and an angel who are here on earth trying to avert the apocalypse instead of help it along, um, even though they're supposed to, uh, because they just like chilling on earth and they don't want it to end. They want to be, they want to be chillers. Um, and so that one's a really fun, uh, book. And as you've mentioned before, um, it, it's often weird. You can, you can taste when one author's um, writing and the other one's not here. Their styles blend really well. Pratchett and Guyman. Um, it becomes like a, a new voice, but you can tell they're both there. Yeah. It's really, it's really a great book and such a great fusion of both of them. Yeah. If you hadn't read it, have not read it, check it out. It's short. It's quick. It's fun. Great one. 
Great. So, well, should we do some post spoilers, Brent? You yeah. Give us a summary you, of what happens in the rest of the book. Yeah. If you have not read it, or you know, don't want to hear, don't want to hear about the end, turn off now. Come back Now's after you the have. Time. And thanks or for stay joining. With us. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. What happens? Elbob Reif has unearthed some ancient Sumerian tablets. And these tablets are, uh, uh, it turns out that Sumerian, the original language, is basically like your brain's original operating system language. And if you can speak to someone in that language, they'll do whatever you tell them to do. And so he is created this religious cult on the raft and sort of converting everybody to it. Um, and the way it expresses itself is through uh, uh, speaking in tongues. And so he, it's like this sort of like evangelical movement. He's sort of like uh, posing as a branch of Christianity, but really it's a way for him to get people to like speak in tongues and for him to be able to control them with this language. At the same time, he's also found like the digital version of this. Uh, it turns out this is like that language, that way to speak like into someone's nervous system is a metavirus that infects lots of civilizations. And he actually also picked up a digital version of it using radio astronomy. So this virus infects civilizations and then convinces them to like send it out through their radio telescopes. So he picked up that version of it, which is able to control the brains of uh, um, people who are good at using computers for reasons that don't make a ton of sense in the book. If you uh, show them basically a QR code, then they like, also get this thing and it fries their brains because they've been hit by this extremely scary QR code. Um, uh, <laughs> and so as they figure all this out, um, they have to go to the raft. There's a bunch of big action scenes. We won't talk about all the exciting stuff that happens, but like, it's very exciting. Everybody's involved. Um, and uh, the good guys win. Big surprise. Um, so yeah, it's extremely fun ending. Um, and I think the thing we should sort of talk about here in the post spoiler section is this like language religion fusion idea. That's sort of like the big idea at the end. Yeah. I mean, and it's frankly, it's kind of a stretch. Um, <laughs> it's a, it, it's a little bit, uh, fantastical, right? The idea that language, um, that we could actually be, uh, hacked into our brains based on using basic language like glossolalia, um, but it's a cool idea in its fantasy, at least, um, based on the mythology and the, the stuff we learn along the way. Um, I mean, what did you think about it? I, I agree that like specifics of how it works do not make a lot of sense. Um, and I think but the, 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 because this is satire, it works better. I'm just like, oh, it's fine. And like our protagonist can use his like handheld nuclear powered, you know, Gatling gun that fires depleted uranium slugs to like defeat all the, like, it's just like, I don't know. It's fine. There's a lot of suspending my disbelief in this, in this. Um, there is a big idea underneath this though, which I do think is really interesting. This idea that like ideas and religion specifically are kind of like viruses. Like they spread between people and they're a way to control and exert control. And there are some, you know, reform movements that are trying to like get rid of that like top down control. But like, yeah, his big idea here is sort of the story of religion over all of history is the story of people trying to use it to gain control over other people and other people trying to like break that control and let religion just like be a thing that people, you know, have that makes their lives better. And I think that idea of like ideas as viruses and the power of religion to like be used as a tool for control and, and that can be a bad thing. I think those are compelling ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting literalization of the metaphor that, that language and ideas can literally hack your brain. Um, they don't literally do that, but as we're seeing more and more in the world, um, information can. So language and ideas definitely can spread and control people um, in a way that's that's less direct. But um, I guess that's why why it gets a pass for me is because I think that the metaphor is really cool, um, and the the way that it's literalized is is just kind of fun, and the book's fun. So who cares? And that the action and the ending are so awesome, anyways, that it didn't it didn't really detract for me. Yeah. So to bring it all back together, so funny some big prophetic ideas and then these like interesting really interesting like metaphors like big high level ideas 
and they're just like, but but all just like fun. It's just fun. It's not trying to take itself too seriously. Um, so anyway, yeah, if you haven't read it, hope you check it out. Hope you love it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for Contact. Yeah, Contact next. And uh, next week, before that, a uh, little video on our favorite sci-fi worlds. So check that out too on YouTube. Yes. All right. Till then, keep reading, y'all. Yeah.